Tommy. And it's a joy to be here to talk about weeds instead of the usual talks I give, is, which are on Vincent van Gogh. That's my <laughs> main talk, but I'm happy to talk about weeds. But well, anyway, just a little background. I'm not considered really an herbalist. Uh, I'm a passionate uh, plant um, person that loves to, as Cindy says, learn more. I'm curious about things. Um, and when I look, thought back, why do I have such an incredible passion for this? Um, I go back to where I grew up, and that was in Switzerland. And there, plant medicines, herbal teas, all these things were readily available all the time and still are at pharmacies. You don't have to go to a nature market or something. Pharmacies will have a lot of information, a lot of products that are based on natural herbs and, and, and weeds. Um, for example, as children, we would drink not sodas, but herbal teas. That's what we would drink. So that whole culture is maybe a little bit more closely uh, connected to the, the traditional Western medicine. Um, I have vivid memories as a child of women in the early spring gathering dandelion greens. And uh, that, you may see that again coming up here in this country too, but and it was part of this culture with the early colonialists because many of the plants that I'm going to show you today are actually plants that are not original to this continent, but have come over with the early settlers, the colonial people who came across from, from Europe and found that a lot of the plants growing there, um, they wanted to have with them because they knew about their nutritional value and the medicinal value. So I did, in the 90s, I begin to grow my own herbs. At this point, it was mostly still for cooking. And I was um, in Los Angeles, where herbs grew all year, and I had 35 different herbs in my garden, and it was fantastically exciting to learn about them. But then I became more involved and learned more, not just about the taste, but that many of these herbs, like oregano and rosemary and so on, also had medicinal values as well as nutritional and taste values. And that got me then more and more interested in here in Vermont to look around my backyard, look around the trails, and uh, investigate what was growing and to find out more about it. So I'm constantly learning. And the other quick thing I wanted to say in terms of foraging wild plants, there are some rules. And um, the biggest number one rule is that if you're going to pick something because you want to eat it or use it any way, you have to be 100% sure what it is. That's really the biggest one. You don't want to endanger yourself. Uh, so 100% sure. Uh, you also have to uh, make sure that wherever you're picking these things, no chemicals have been sprayed. And so stay away also um, 50 yard feet uh, on the highway, either side of the highway, if you want to pick anything, or anywhere where you may think that something has been sprayed. So just make sure you, you know it's safe. And then um, when you harvest plants, don't harvest the whole patch of nettles or something. Always just in measure. Leave something growing. The Native Americans have that policy too. You don't take everything that you see, but just leave things growing so that the next person can find, also that everything can replenish itself. And the last foraging rule, which I like when I read the Herbalist's Golden Rules, was pick everything with gratitude. It's a gift. So on to the first herb. Anybody know this one? You do. Say it. Coltsfoot. <laughs> yeah. This is Coltsfoot, one of the first ones that blooms in the spring. And I know when you, for example, drive down the road to Hildeen, on either side, it's yellow, bright yellow in the early spring. So it's the first flower to bloom and an important one for the bees and any insects that are dependent on nectar. They often are um, you know, mistaken for dandelions, but uh, they are not. And um, for um, 2,000 years, this particular plant has been used as a cough medicine. And the Latin word tussilago has to do with tousser in French means to cough. So it was a very important and widely used uh, popular cough medicine. The leaves are edible too. And after the, the flowers bloom, you will get just some fluff that will, uh, the tufts of these, that will make you think of dandelions. But then for the rest of the summer, after the early fall, all you will see are these green leaves. And they are the shape of a colt's foot. So that's why the name um, in English. 
Um, so it is used by um, also Native Americans, for example. Many of these herbs came and weeds came over from Europe or Asia and settled then as the colonists settled in the country. And it didn't take the Native Americans very long to understand the medicinal uses of these herbs as well as the nutritional value. So already the, the Native Americans would use the roots of this cult's foot, boil them to treat then the cough that they had or some kind of a respiratory ailment. So it was without them reading any medical books, they discovered that medicinal property. In World War I, the veterans who were suffering from lung disease due to poison gas were actually served cups of tea made with cult's foot and comfrey and sweetened with honey to ease the respiratory um, distress they had from the gas. So this is going far, far back as a use for easing inflammation and swelling and the burning also on the skin, for example. You can do lots of things. It has fallen a little bit out of favor because there are many other plants that are now used to heal bronchial and respiratory ailments. The next one, that's common everywhere, growing on roadsides, in your backyard, I'm sure. And it is a very, very uh, important weed plant. Um, the Anglo-Saxons, going way back, called this the mother of herbs because it has tremendous healing qualities. It's called roadleaf plantain. Uh, plantago mayor, or you have also the, the narrow-leaved one, which is rib, ribwort plantain. Now, the word planta is interesting, and so some of these plants have very um, fascinating history, because planta comes from the Latin for the sole of your foot, as in plantar fasciitis. And the Romans called it that, because wherever they went to conquer the world, this plant followed and it grew everywhere. And when it was brought over to this country and began to grow, as we see everywhere here too, the Native Americans also called it a foot, the Englishman's foot or the white man's foot. They just realized that wherever the, the colonists settled, wherever they moved to, this plant just came along with them. The seeds were important. Uh, the nutritional value of the plantain has, um, is that it's rich in potassium. Um, the leaves have antiseptic quality and are astringent and refrigerant. And what I mean by refrigerant is, for example, you get a sting by a bee or a wasp and you get that swelling and that heat. You crush the leaf, and I've done this many times, several leaves, doesn't matter if it's a broad-leafed or the, the, the thin-leaved one, crush it between your hands and place it on the sting. And it cools it down and brings the swelling down and takes the pain away. It's very, very important to know this about it if you're working in your gardens and you get stung. The Native Americans also used it um, to uh, heal snake bites, uh, to treat wounds and colds. So they too learned the medicinal value and often also the, the, the nutritional value of these plants very quickly. Um, I use it in the winter. So there is a jar of it on that table. I dry them, the leaves of the plantain, and then in the winter, I make tea to heal a bronchial cough, and it does work. So it's something I harvest over, over the course of the summer months. Um, it does other things. It's beneficial for kidney disorders, for example. Many of these weeds, these plants, have more than one purpose. They, they, they heal you in different areas, which is not when you buy a traditional medicine, you, you buy it for one ailment in your body. But a plant like this will go wherever it is needed. And very often it has more uh, different uh, uh, possibilities of healing. So that brings me to another one that is a very, very well-rounded nutritional and medicinal herb. Anybody know? I, I purposely put a large picture there because you don't see them this large in nature. It's harder. Do you know what it is? It's self-heal. Self yes, it is. Right. Yeah. It's self-heal or heal all. And um, it's a little plant that you almost don't notice how beautiful the flowers are because it grows down in the ground amongst the grass and it's pervasive also. And it also comes from um, Britain and Europe. 
that wasn't native to this country either. But uh, I was at a powwow in the northeastern part of Vermont, uh, Native American, a, a Naki uh, powwow, and just walking around, and a Native American came to me, and he, he just picked one of these little things up and said, this is what we use to heal sore throats and respiratory ailments. And I would not have paid attention to that little plant at that point. So I found that really fascinating. It is, um, the whole plant is usable, the leaves, the flowers, it is edible, and it is medicinal. You can eat it in salads and soups, but it is really best known for its healing properties. And um, let me just see here, the, um, it is antibacterial, it is antiseptic, it is astringent, it is diuretic, it helps with stomach ailments, it's a vermifuge mm -hmm. if you have intestinal worms. So it has an amazing array of things that it will heal. Um, you use these plants often uh, as an infusion. You boil water, you pour it over the plant and let it steep for 10 minutes, and then you have that as a tea. Or you can use them, the infusion as a compress to put on, on a, a, heal, a, a wound that doesn't heal very well. This um, was also interesting to read about because clinical analysis shows that it is antibacterial for certain bacteria, E. coli, for example. And um, so so it is used in alternative medicine very often. If you go to a doctor that uses alternative medicine, this would be one of the herbs that would be possibly used. Um, and the other thing it is uh, doing, it's, it's showing a promise in research for cancer, AIDS, and diabetes. So some of these plants are coming back into the mainstream of medicine, and they're doing some research and discovering that what it has been used as for hundreds, sometimes thousands of years for certain ailments, it is substantiated by scientific study. So it's fascinating just to see uh, what is all available. Again, as you walk in your yard, you have the pharmacy under your feet. Anybody know this one? This is also at large, and you usually don't see it this big. Grandaddy. Grandaddy, that's right. Yeah, glaucoma heterase. I love the Latin words too. And uh, for most of the history of this plant, let me show you the word, the name. Ground ivy right there. And it's also, you must have it in your yards. It's just everywhere. And it, and it pulls out easily. The roots are not very deep. Um, and it is, again, it's another herb. And I don't know if you've looked at this ground ivy and thought of it as possibly something for the medicinal cabinet. Yeah. Do all of these um, require full sun? Not all of them, no. You'll find some of these more in the hedges, where it's more shady, in different places. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, so this one also is known as an herb for treating diverse medical problems. The whole herb is used. Um, the Saxons used it already way back to um, put it in their beer to give it a bitter taste. And bitter often in herbs has, is a very good um, um, quality for digestive issues. So their beers were, uh, had an added medicinal quality to it. Um, it is very high in vitamin C, mm -hmm. so if you do make an infusion or if you take the leaves and put them in your salad, you're adding a little bit more vitamins to your meal. Uh, it was used to treat scurvy in the early days of, uh, of, of the settlers here. That's what they used to, to receive the, the nutrients and the, and the vitamins. It was used for, um, and still today can be of course used for lung ailments from bronchitis for persistent cough, for digestion, for cleansing kidneys, purifying the blood. So many of these plants, as I'm showing you here, you need to do your own research also. But if you are feeling a little bit down, and oftentimes in the spring after a long winter, this is what the people would do. They would take these early weeds, these early plants, and make a tea to regenerate themselves, to give them uh, the, the energy that they were lacking through a long winter. Um, it is also used, for example, in combination with chamomile and uh, yarrow, another weed that I'm not showing you today, to heal abscesses and skin uh, wounds. 
So as a, with a compress, a lot of these can be used internally or as an external, um, you know, compress or um, there's another word for it, that. Um, but again, an innocuous little herb, little weed that just grows everywhere, it that has a lot of power to it. And I would add that <clears throat> it's one of the first plants to blossom in the spring. Yes. And it's an active pollinator plant. Exactly. I and mean, that's good. I'm glad you're bringing that up. Because yeah. many of these are, like the, yeah. like the coltsfoot, for example, and others that begin to bloom, like the next one. Um, these are excellent pollinator plants because they bloom so early. And that's when the, when the insects and the bees especially need to replenish themselves. Anybody know this one? What did you say? It's, well, um, a yuga. Did you say that? Because it is, it is a, called a bugle weed. A yuga reptans. Once it takes a foot in any of your gardens, it won't stop. <laughs> and you will have a ground cover of it all. But it's beautiful. And again, in the spring, the, the purple and the fresh green just makes a beautiful um, picture. So uh, this also is native to Europe and Western Asia. And it came over with the early settlers. They're you know, responsible for lots of the things that we're seeing in our backyards and on the trails. Um, it, it was known um, to make ointments, and you would have to boil it in hog fat or something like that uh, for bruises. Uh, Nicholas Culpepper said you shouldn't be without this plant and boiled in some hog lard and you know put in a little jar and kept for any time you, you, you bump yourself, you hurt yourself, you bruise yourself. It's a very important herb for them. Um, it also, this is another thing, it has um, properties that um, uh, lower blood pressure, for example, um, its uh, action even resembles digitalis, which is taken for heart problems. So again, some of these are potent, but they're not as potent as you would take a drug. You, you have, but you have to always be very much informed when you take anything like this, uh, how it might interact with medicine you're already taking. But they do have these amazing, um, properties, beautiful as they are, they serve us. This one, I really enlarge this flower. What is it? Purslane. Yeah. Anybody see that in their gardens? Because what you really see is a really low sort of brown cover with a red stalk and succulent. Anybody read the book Stalking the Wild Asparagus by Ewell Gibbons? I have a copy there. He swears by this one and another one and says that these are the most important two herbs, the next one and this one, that you should know about. It is so incredibly nutritious. Uh, and it is valued as a food and grown as a vegetable in East India and the Persians used it already more than 2,000 years ago as a staple food. Um, and Ewell Gibbons actually calls it India's gift to us. So again, it came over with, with settlers. Um, most of us just don't really look at it so much. It's not that, this is, it's not like a dandelion, which you really have to do something about, you think, but purslane is just there, very, very subtle but it packs in a lot of nutrients. It is a terrific source, for example, of omega-3 fatty acids. So fish oil and purslane is a good source of that. It is very high in iron. It is high in vitamin C, and also contains calcium and beta-carotene. So this little plant, if you pick it, wash it, strew the leaves into your salad, you are bumping up the nutritional value of your lunch <laughs> quite a bit. Um, and they are good in salad, but they also good as cooked vegetables. As I said, the, the um, Indians and Persians and so on, and still uh, ethnic groups in this country will probably buy this in stores or grow it in their gardens as a staple vegetable. Um, the Native Americans also found use for it. They um, used the seeds of purslane and ground them in with other uh, grains to make flour. So um, as 
as a medicine. It is more used, I think, as a food, but as a medicine, it also has properties to relieve a dry cough. So um, it's a good um, it's a good herb to know, easy to to find. Um, if you mix it, um, if you mix some of the juice with, um, let's say, another uh, carrier oil, a juice of that, you can relieve swollen gums and um, help fasten loose teeth. Apparently, so it's a good mouthwash for for ailments in the mouth. Next one. Lab squatters, right? Lab squatters, yeah. So this is the other one that um, Jürgen and says you should know about. Because those two, first lane and land squatters, you have a, you'll pack a lot of nutrients into your into your um, staple food supply. Um, it was actually domesticated. It's a it's anybody have this growing in their yard? Yeah, yeah. If you use manure or compost from a farm, for example, those seeds will come with it and you will have it growing. That's how I got mine. I didn't have them until I used some, comp some um, compost from a farm. Um, it grows abundantly if the soil is good. And usually, as I say, with compost, it grew and it keeps growing all summer long. And I go out in the yard and I mostly eat labs. So again, as a vegetable, it was cultivated for fresh greens, fresh vegetables. Um, for example, if anybody has chickens, lamb's quarters, when fed to the chickens, will make their yolks turn really dark orange and probably be healthier too. Um, the nutritional value of lamb's quarters, it provides more beta carotene, calcium, potassium, iron than spinach. So see that you can find it in your garden and use it. And uh, besides those that I just mentioned, it's also an excellent source of the vitamins A, C, B. So just a handful of this, and you have you you're packing in some more um, wonderful things in your food. Um, the Native Americans also uh, discovered that this was very good as a food, and they used it. Um, you can use this herb as you would spinach, um, and you pick it abundantly because it just keeps growing all summer long, and cut it up and saute it and make a frittata with it or just really incorporate it into anything you would put spinach in. Um, the Native Americans used a tea made with these uh, leaves as poultices for swelling. So again, it, it has mostly nutritional value, but other, other um, wonderful things can, can come with it too. Um, a refugee market in Alaska where Bhutanese refugees, the refugees uh, are living. One of the women brought lab quarter seeds from the Himalayas, where it actually has been domesticated. She brought those seeds with her to Alaska and is now selling lab quarters in a refugee farmer's market in Alaska. So that's how important some of these plants are. And, um, and I think what, what I like to do is to talk about this to, to make us all realize how, what a wealth of wonderful things we have mm -hmm. just growing this, uh, below our feet, basically. Can I add one thing about that? Yes. That its South American cousin is quinoa. Yes, you're right. I have it in my notes. There's so many Sorry. things that I put, but you're right. It is. It is. It is. Coming also from that region of the world, it is related to quinoa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the seeds are... are Collectible, exactly. Yeah. And I Thank had you. one thing too. Um, if you find you like it, uh, it freezes very well. Okay. Much yeah. better than spinach, yeah. I think. Yeah. 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 It's a good frozen cooked vegetable. Yeah. Cool. So, anyone want seeds? I can give you some <laughs> <laughs> to plant. All right. I don't. I'm looking at my watch. Okay, we're doing it. Anyone know this one? I also enlarged it. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Chickweed, yeah, chickweed. <laughs> Again, it's one of those little creepy things that sort of hides around the edges of things. And you know, you, I pull it up, I weed it, uh, but it packs in another wonderful amount of interesting nutrients. Uh, it's another European native. Again, coming uh, and followed uh, human settlements as people were settling west. Um, let's see. 
Its uh, stems and leaves are succulent, and the whole plant can be used. And again, listen to the nutritional value of this very uh, small, creepy little weed. Um, it is rich in potassium, again, another one of those minerals that, that we need. And it's loaded with the vitamins B6, B12, C, and D. Really? It has beta carotene, iron, calcium, phosphorus, zinc, manganese. That's what it has. And you can eat every part of it. So again, fresh in salads. Um, take some like watercress and put it in a sandwich, you know, in the between two slices. And you can add it to egg salad, chicken salad, and you have all these nutritional things that are added to it. Um, as a tea, for example, it is recommended also, like many of these weeds, for cough, colds, even for arthritic conditions. So what, if you have an interest in any of these plants, buy some books, and I have two or three that I recommend, so that you can look through them, and whatever you think you need help with, you will find more than one plant to help you. Um, Herbalist prescribed, for example, chickweed for uh, convalescence for centuries. People who were um, weakened by some illness or something, they would be given chickweed tea to drink. Uh, people who had tuberculosis or anemia, um, they would be strengthened by a tea. And you can understand why when you heard all these ingredients and nutritional values. And to make a tea with chickweed, it's so easy. You take one to two tablespoons of this fresh chickweed, cover it with a cup of boiling water, wait for 20 minutes. The next one, I think, I don't have to ask you what it is. <laughs> it's a wonderful pollinator plant also, one of the earliest to bloom, and one of the ones that um, has been in use for more than a thousand years. <laughs> as food and as medicine. It's, uh, the ancient Egyptians already used it. And Arabian physicians used it and felt that this was a plant that healed many different maladies. So it goes back a long, long time. And again, it's not originally from this continent. It came from Europe. Early immigrants introduced it to the New World to heal and to comfort and to feed them. I read a wonderful story of, a, of a, a, a woman who was one of the early settlers who went further west, left her home, but she didn't leave without a little bag of dandelion seeds because she knew wherever she would plant them, in the spring, she would have the first greens that she could use. Yes? I heard that they were brought over to um, provide food for the honeybees, which were always brought, also brought over because they're not native. I don't know if that's connected with them, but it could be that's that they brought the dandelions for that purpose. That's possible. But I do know that the the greens or the roots and the greens of the dandelions are very nutritious also. And that the settlers, well, they would have had all of that knowledge, probably too, for the bees. Um, yeah. Let's see. But uh, the thing is about dandelions, I have a thing about dandelions. <laughs> <laughs> because in our culture, in part of our culture, the dandelion is supposed is, is ruined weapons against them. And um, there is, it's interesting because there's no plant probably that is easily recognized as a dandelion, as much hated as a dandelion, mm -hmm. and so systematically singled out for extermination. So I've, I've written little articles in the journal to let people know, do not do anything to those dandelions. They need to be there. They need to be there for our bees. And if they're there for our bees, then you too can benefit from them. So let them grow. <laughs> and the other thing that most of us didn't know, and I didn't either, was that dandelions are actually good for business. Because this is interesting to me. We are, on the one hand, trying to get rid of dandelions in our perfect lawns. But on the other hand, Every year, large quantities of leaves supply a popular demand for fresh greens in ethnic grocery stores, and the United States imports more than a thousand pounds of dandelion roots to use for patented medicine. So 
So deep down, there is the knowledge that this dandelion is more than just a pest. So we should, we should keep, keep them growing, keep using them. And if you really think you have too many in your garden, go dig them out. The roots are healthy. I have a jar of roots here. And eat the greens. And I eat them all year long, not just in the spring. In the spring, they're less bitter. But you can eat them all year long. They are, again, full of, let's see, where uh, nutritional value, rich in protein, these dandelion greens, and phosphorus, calcium, riboflavin, niacin, which is a B I iron, vitamins A, B, and C. I got dandelion leaves for my winter drinks, and in the summer I eat them, obviously. Um, dandelion roots, I boil to make a tea. Then the medicinal value of, of dandelions um, has to do with cleansing the blood, supporting your liver function, giving you the lift you need after a long winter, for example. And that's why the, the early settlers were so um, adamant to have them growing in their yards. 10 to 15 dandelion leaves, for example, have the same amount of calcium as a six ounce glass of milk. So. <laughs> you get your calcium when you eat it. Um, I've got a picture here of the little buds. Those are called poor man's capers. Mm -hmm. So before the, the dandelions bloom, you can pick those little buds and saute them with onions and mix them with other things that you, that you, you want to saute and, and uh, eat. Um, so that's my spiel of dandelions. Now, another nice little flower that you don't see this big and probably wouldn't maybe recognize. Anybody know? You, do you know what it is? Creepers. Bed straw. It's called, bed, well, there are many different names. Right. Let me show you the picture of how it grows. You've all got this probably somewhere. It also is sort of easy to take out. Uh, it's pervasive. It grows everywhere. Uh, it has many different names. Um, goose grass, because geese do love it also. Catchweed, cleavers, it clings to everything. Um, they're more the 5,000 species of this type of plant. And in, in, in that family, the Ruby, Rubiaceae family, you even have the coffee plant. You have quinine um, and other, other plants that offer drugs. Um, so it is quite a, a, a well-used plant. Bed straw itself um, is even used in China for, um, it says, uh, an age-old antiperspirant. So, <laughs> Different cultures will find different uses. In England, um, the bed straw was used not for the nutritional value, but for the dye. The roots will give you a red dye, and they used it to give the beautiful orange-yellow color of their famous Cheshire cheese. They use it as rennet to curdle milk and also to dye their cheese. So it was used in different, different ways. But it's high in vitamin C also. And uh, again, this is another one of those um, plants that in the early spring, in Germany, for example, would be uh, made into a spring drink, a tonic, to help you, you know, cleanse your blood and get yourself back on, on your feet. Um, seeds of bed straw, by the way, can be roasted until they're dark brown and make a substitute for coffee, which I'm sure the settlers did when they didn't have uh, a way to get coffee. Um, it is used medicinally also for many different things, for head colds, against insomnia, to dissolve stones in the bladder. So all these different things are listed as um, medicinal qualities of this herb. The fact that it's called bed straw, another little uh, historic <laughs> um, note here, it was actually used to stuff mattresses. To, was used as bed straw, or just stru used among the straw that the people used to sleep on, or to stuff their mattresses with. And uh, it probably also probably was a moth repellent and a bug repellent too. Many of these strewing herbs were. So, next one you will recognize, but it's um, probably you will recognize. Anybody know what this one is? It's another fantastic pollinator. Again, looking at it at this size, it's difficult to, to, to know what it is, but it is a clover, sweet clover, meli lotus, and meli is, comes from the Latin word for honey, miel. Um, let's see, it's another one of an, of an uh, Eastern European origin, 
coming over with the settlers. Um, but this plant is really good. Anyone have this in their gardens at all? I've, you see it maybe more in meadows. Um, it's a most useful plant, uh, great, great crop plant, because what it does, it fixes nitrogen from the atmosphere. It has, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a valued soil building weed. They take the nitrogen supply from the air and feed it to the millions of special bacteria that live in nodules in the plant's roots. And then these bacteria fix the nitrogen and give it to the plant. So the plant doesn't take nitrogen from the soil, it actually produces its own nitrogen. And then if you, if you let it uh, go to seed or let it die in the, in the spring and you leave it on your ground, it'll add the nutritional value, it will regenerate the soil with nitrogen. Um, it's a, as, a, as a nutritional plant, it has a, a great, is a great source of protein, for example. Uh, you can eat the seeds. You can add it to salads and stews and soups. You can eat the fresh long, young leaves, again as a salad or steamed. So this plant too is abundant. If you look, once you start looking for them, you'll see them more in the meadows. <clears throat> it has um, uh, actually a vanilla flavor. So if you took a little bit, the, one of the little uh, petals and just tasted it, you would taste the sweetness and the vanilla flavor. So it's also been used by bakers to add to cookies, cakes, and pastries to add the vanilla flavor. And um, some of these herbs, and I haven't mentioned uh, most of them that do this, but they're also good if you make a tea or an infusion with them to use as a, a facial cooling or astringent as a cos in the, for cosmetic uses. Some of these plants have that too. too. So um, as a tea, it also is good uh, for the, the digestion. I usually drink mint tea if I need to help my digestion, but a sweet clover plant would do the same thing. So, now this one you know. Again, I love this picture because it makes it look much more <laughs> important or impressive. And this is, of course, the red clover. And this clover, uh, this plant, this, has anybody ever drunk it or collected it and made it into a tea? It's very healthy and full of nutrients too. Um, it has um, many amino acids. It has carotene, vitamin C, D, E, K, and the B group. And trace elements of copper, manganese, cobalt, sulfur, boron, and it's high in protein. This, again, ordinary little clover that grows in the fields around us has all of this nutritional value. Um, in the early days, and, and, the, and it came again over to America with the English settlers, and their descendants continued to use this. So these were encouraged to grow, um, and because the early settlers were English, they loved to drink tea, and because they could not afford the imported tea beverages, tea was made out of whatever they had, and clover was a big um, plant that they used for tea drinking, knowing the, the value they had in it. Just um, the leaves? Pardon? Just the leaves? Uh, no, both. The, the flowers too. I actually have, not in here, but I have mostly picked the flowers with some of the leaves attached, because the leaves are really close to the, the flowering top. You pick that, the top with the leaves, and then you again, fresh or dried, put it in a, in a cup, hot water over it, and let it steep. Yeah. Um, it has many, uh, and some people eat them too, the leaves especially, in salads. Um, I prefer to make a tea with it. Um, contemporary Chinese medicine uses uh, the um, clover and have also done studies uh, with the clover and proven that it kills certain viral and fungal infections. So many, and I'm not even mentioning all the qualities that the books list, but many of them are antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral, have those antiseptic, have those qualities. Um, the, the red clover is also uh, a very good tonic just for the whole body, again, 
to, to strengthen your, um, your blood, your, it will help your liver function better. So it's a very, very good plant. Again, easily available. As long as you know things have not been sprayed, you can pick them in anywhere. This one is <laughs> it's the oxide daisy. Yeah, a beautiful design and grows abundantly, especially in soils that are turning sour. So if you have a lot of these growing in your garden or in your, in your lawn, then you know you need to add some lime or some um, bone meal to sweeten up the soil. It's an indication that it's, that it's not, uh, not balanced. But it also has other uses. It's, again, I don't know, it was um, probably also came over, yeah, by the early settlers. Um, it's an effective insect repellent, so that's a good thing to know. You rub the fresh herb, flower, leaves onto your skin before you go outside and it's supposed to repel insects. Um, it relieves cough if you make a tea with it, so again it has those anti-septic um, and antiviral, antibacterial functions. But what is so nice about this one too, that it has a very valuable cosmetic quality. Anybody know the term, as fresh as a daisy? Have you heard of that? Yeah. <laughs> and it comes from this, freshly expressed juice from the stems of the oxide daisy should be applied at bedtime, sleep with it on your face, washed off the following morning to get rid of all kinds of blemishes, so that you look as fresh as a daisy. <laughs> well, uh, and it does, it is known to soothe and smooth and rough, roughen skin as a cosmetic use. So um, that's a nice one to know. And uh, also uh, it, it, it compresses with, a, with an infusion, relieves swollen eyes, um, swollen eyelids. So it has more maybe cosmetic qualities than food qualities. Anyone know what this is? Mm -hmm. nettles. Stinging nettles, yeah. I planted some because I like what I can do with them. I've dried some, so I have them there too. Stinging nettle is very rich in iron, and it again has more iron than spinach does. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can harvest it uh, in the spring. They don't they don't give you the uh, the reaction with welts, but if you want to be careful, you harvest it with gloves. Once you wash the nettle and then you saute or, or steam them, they don't have that you know, allergic reaction anymore. Um, but it is, it's an interesting herb, and you can buy uh, many of these weeds and herbs that I'm mentioning. You can buy extracts of them or capsules at the nature market or in dry form, in bulk. You can buy many of these things that I've mentioned here. With um, nettle, you buy the capsules because the best way to have it is freeze-dried. Um, the most medicinal and nutritional quality from a nettle is not boiling it. I mean, you still get the iron, but the other medicinal qualities you'll get from a freeze from freeze-dried nettles, which those capsules are often filled with freeze-dried nettles, and they're often used to help uh, reduce inflammatory reactions in the body. So they cause us to have a reaction, but they're also used to help people who have allergic reactions to diminish them. It's an interesting uh, phenomenon. Migraines, inflammatory joint conditions, and allergies are all improved by the use of nettle. Again, the best way, if you have issues like that, would be to buy the capsules. I like to, to um, make the tea with, with my dried nettles that I dry in a, in a dehydrator. But uh, you, you can go to the, the nature market and you can find out lots of different things you do with, uh, with uh, many of these plants. I have a few more. Anybody know what this is? It's hard to see when you just see like uh, no leaves and it's out of, out of uh, focus in terms of size. It's nettle, I mean sheep sorrel, sorry, sheep sorrel. Also a food staple in Europe, already in the Roman, uh, during Roman times. It was used, uh, the seeds were used, um, it contains a lot of vitamin C, again. Um, it's used as a cooked vegetable, oftentimes. Um, and medicinally, it also is a mildly antiseptic plant, laxative, lots of ways to heal sores with an infusion of sorrel. And you have this one, and, and the leaves are very recognizable. You see that there, the rosette, and then you have the yellow one, curly dock. 
is another uh, in the same plant. It's um, during World War II, for example, um, they were used um, in military field hospitals to help heal wounds that were hard to heal with compresses made out of this uh, plant. This is another little plant that grows sort of on the edges of buildings uh, or edges of um, woods, bases of fences, crevices and walls. It's found off the, and when it is found off the beaten track, if you can't encounter these somewhere in the middle of nowhere, you can almost read into that that there has been a settlement there because this is a kind of plant that followed settlers. There are others too. And Stephanie, you gave me a book about reading the forested landscape. So you can walk through the forest and you see a plant that's not normally there, but it is there because of the fact that there was a settlement. So they use this kind of plant actually to discover old settlements in, in forests and so on. It's very interesting. It's used homeopathically quite a bit uh, for gout and jaundice and all kinds of other ailments like that. Um, oh, I didn't show you the next picture. There it is. <laughs> so it's a celandine. I didn't tell you the name even. Um, but it's, I don't know if you have it. I have it. I've seen it in many places here in Vermont. This one, anyone know? Oh, Malin. Malin, yeah. It's a big, big plant. Um, grows sometimes six, over six feet tall. Um, it's another one of those plants that uh, is a pollinator, wonderful pollinator. So um, encourage it to grow. It has some interesting little historic things. For example, the leaves are big and thick. And they were used um, by the Romans, actually, the Roman soldiers conquering Europe. Um, in their shoes to prevent their feet from touching. When they're leather, the, their shoes got thin. The leaves would coat their shoes, their feet. Um, but what it was really used for uh, was uh, as a tinder to, to make torches, to make candle wicks. It's also called the candle wick plant. It's very hairy and the leaves would be dried and the little hair would be used and made into candle wicks. Also, the stem would be dipped into tallow and made into torches. And where I grew up in, in Europe, it was actually called the king's candle. So it would be used as big, big torches that you could lighten up uh, the outside. Um, but medicinally, it's also used for coughing. It's a, a known herb uh, to be used for bronchial issues or uh, respiratory issues. And a great pollinator, as I said. Anybody know this one? Echosinum. You've got this growing everywhere too in Vermont. Yeah. Horsetail? Horse horse Field horsetail? It's one of the oldest plants, most primitive of the fern families, and fossil records show that this hasn't changed mm -hmm. since fossils, mm -hmm. time of the fossils. <laughs> it's high in silica. Uh, and is used um, uh, also for different things, but nutritionally it contains vitamins and minerals also, obviously silica. And um, it is used for all kinds of, again, gout, skin afflictions, all kinds of things where these nutritional values are necessary. It uh, enriches the blood and strengthens the fingernails, so you make teas with this and you absorb down that, that silicon in your body with it. It's also used in the household. Um, to scour, to scour uh, dishes, well, they used to, we don't do that anymore. But even uh, metalsmiths to make arrowheads sharper, they would use the, the silicon, it's hard, it's, it's a scrubber in, in a way, to uh, polish and to, to scrub things. It's an interesting herb too. But it grows prolifically and you need to you know, stop it if you don't want it going everywhere. And I'm gonna end uh, with this one, which we all know, I think, <laughs> the milkweed. <laughs> Yeah, important weed that we need to make sure we plant everywhere because it's one of the best pollinators for the monarchs and also for, the, for other insects. But it's also incredibly um, 
nutritional and used in all its stages of growth for food. Yule Gibbons writes about it, and he writes about how to prepare the young shoots of milkweed, or the buds, or the flowers, and your mouth waters the way he describes cooking them um, with you know, butter and salt and pepper and so on. It's, it's really a very versatile plant. However, I don't encourage you to take the shoots because we want them to grow so they become um, the food for the borak larvae. So it's important that we make sure they, they, this gets spread. So I think that's the end. I just put another little quote there because hopefully, and I do this when I read about weeds or read about anything and I see them in nature, they become friends. They become a little bit more familiar. And you, you begin to see them more, too. You begin to realize they're abundant. And when you recognize something, it's a thrill, I think. So anyway, any questions that you'd like to ask?